Knoxville Game Design November 2019 Scratch Welcome everyone to Knoxville Game Design for November 2019. This is a monthly discussion of our game projects and topics in the games industry. My name is Levi Smith. You may know some of my games, TTY, GFX Adventure, and Kitty's Adventure. Um, this month, uh, Dylan, he's not going to be able to join us, but, so hopefully he'll be back uh, next time. Uh, so I'm going to start out with a little bit of news. So we had someone, uh, Chris, wrote in to us. And he's asking, do you or any of your members have experience with Click Team Fusion? Um, yeah, I actually asked Dylan about this in a message. And I think he said it was maybe a part of a Steam bundle or something. Um, I, I haven't played run with it. But I remember Paul Green, who had came to a few of our meetings um, a while back. I think he did some Ludum Dare entries and... Click Team Fusion, so yeah, you can check him out at pjgdevelopments.com. He's PJG Hangouts on uh, social media. Um, I'm not sure if he develops many games anymore. PJG Developments.com. Is it development? Yeah, so he used to do quite a few Ludum Dari entries. I'm not sure. I think he does a lot of streaming. He plays a lot of games and, I guess, post cat photos. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I think you can, somewhere you can, yeah, click Team Fusion 2.5 right here. So, I guess he has a link to his Ludum Dari projects right here. His Click Team Fusion. Yeah, so you can see some of the stuff. I remember him coming to some of our meetings years ago showing off some of the games that he's developed. So it seems like it's a, a, a neat environment. I haven't done anything with Click Team Fusion myself. But I remember the Snowman game, Build the Snowman, they developed in the Wrench and Socket game that he made. So yeah, if uh, you want to know more about Click Team Fusion... <clears throat> Definitely recommend getting in touch with Paul Green, PJG Hangouts. Okay, so I know one thing, uh, Dylan, he's been working on uh, Inktober. I think he does this once a year in October where you create uh, a uh, many different uh, pieces of artwork in ink. <clears throat> I think this year he did a little bit more in watercolor. He actually had a pretty good picture of his uh, his setup right here with all his watercolor paints and layout. Yeah, I really wanted to ask Dylan this month about how to get started, what supplies you need, and just his overall process. And he did, uh, uh, I did asked him a little bit about it through a direct message. And um, he did say when he's working with black ink, he uses the Kura, I think it's Kuratake, if that's Japanese. By by Moji pens and Copic Multiliner SP. He says that Hobby Lobby carries a few of the Kuratake and Jerry's uh, Art Artorama carries Co Copics. That's where he's ordered those. And he said the paints are Marie's watercolor squeezed into a palette. Uh, you can buy preloaded palettes though. So, yeah, hopefully Dylan will be back soon, maybe in an upcoming episode, maybe he can tell us a little bit. I, I know uh, art, I mean, art is a part of game development, and uh, I could see how these could be used for a game. I did ask him if I could use some of these that he's made uh, as the intro art for the game design podcast. We've been doing, I've been using uh, Dylan's... Uh, outdoor hiking photos but I think it'd be neat to change it up a little bit he's done a, a lot of great art so you can yeah find him at Dylan Wolf D-Y-L-A-N-W-O-L-F on Twitter and view all of his Inktober pictures yeah he was like post I don't think he did one every day but he did quite a few 
Um, and you can view all those. I don't know if he has like a Patreon or anything where, where you can donate or anything. I was going to ask him about that. Or or even uh, he may have like a Deviant Art where you can uh, find all of his artwork. I'm not sure. He's probably Dylan Wolf, I'm assuming. But yeah, he put a lot of work into uh, all of these different... Uh, yeah, it looks like Red Bubble. I've never been to Redbubble, but maybe he has all of his artwork on Redbubble. <clears throat> yeah, so he has like a ghost from Pac-Man, uh, a treasure chest, and I think each day in Inktober they have like a different theme or a different keyword or something like that, so they kind of uh, just do a piece of art based on whatever the keyword for the day is and it sounds like if you miss a day it's not the end of the world you know i don't think they grade or rate any of these um i think it's just kind of kind of like a ludum dare you do it your your prize is your artwork i guess but i don't know maybe they do have rankings i'm i'm not sure i, th I think it's just they come up with something every day i really like this one of the dragon right here breathing fire and one of a snowy hill with footsteps and baseball player the theme was swing for that or the keyword was swing frail he has some some branches and twigs in in, in grass and i like this one it's kind of like a orb with some mist or something coming off of it enchanted uh, an ear of corn that was for husky <laughs> uh, like a little wood shed here freeze another snowy like road with hills in the background mm, yeah, I think that may be oh here, this may be day three bait it's like a fishing hook with some lure on there and yeah here's one of some gears mindless and yeah it looks like the first one was ring like a ring from lord of the rings <clears throat> yeah, it's a very cool background what he did with the the water cuts yeah i don't know if he starts with the ring first and then fills in the background or that he has to like start with the ring first the object first then fill in the rest but it's still like really amazing not to even see if i was doing this i would have the pink like mixed in with the ring and all over the place so yeah really cool stuff from dylan check out his inktober stuff uh really good stuff there so also uh chris gardner who i think he moves between <coughs> Knoxville. He's originally from Huntsville. He does the Dev Space Conference, I think, every October. Um, he does this extra life playing games for kids um, fundraiser. I think it's already happened. I think it was like a few days ago, like November 2nd or something. Um, so yeah, I, I saw him on Twitter talking about this. I was like, hey, why don't you play some of our like indie games and things like that. So he's like, oh, what games do you got on Xbox? I was like, well, I got Kitty's Adventure. So I think he might have played Kitty's Adventure on this. So I went ahead and donated. It looks like you can donate whatever you want. It looks like the default was $50, but you can change that to what whatever you want. Yeah, it looks like Chris Gardner, he's been doing this for nine years now. So he's he's been doing it for quite a while. You can find him on social media as Freestyle Coder. He also has a website, blog.freestylecoding.com. I'm not sure how. Yeah, it looks like the last update he's had on here was 2016, but he does have a lot of his older stuff. I don't think he's ever done any game jams, but he used to do game development talks at Codestock here in Knoxville uh, years ago. Uh, I know he was a XNA developer, and I think he just like did some like little small projects and things like that. So yeah, check him out. And also, I noticed that Mike Neal, he used to uh, be in our group. He has done some Pico 8 tutorials on his 
YouTube channel. I think you'd can I think you just look up V I N U L L and he has a playlist of Pico 8 tutorials. So it looks like uh he starts from the beginning and talks about uh, how to move sprites, using the map better curve, moving the camera, gravity and jumping, and pick up and list. So yeah, check that out. Uh, if you're interested in Pico 8, very good uh, environment for developer or new developers for learning, things like that. And finally, I, I, I noticed that, uh, yeah, Siege, SiegeCon, it's in Atlanta, it's like a game developer conference. I haven't been to this one yet. I think I'm actually be like up toward Marietta, actually. Um, but uh, I've noticed they have been putting their videos on online now. So I think you just go to uploads and it should show all of their videos. I haven't watched these, so I can't I can't say how well how good the content is. But uh, it's it's probably worth checking out. If anybody watches these, let me know. Let me know how these are. But yeah, it looks like they have a lot of panels, and I'm not sure if they have like a, a showroom floor or anything. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, looks like uh, it's a pretty good conference here. So I'll probably watch some of these later just to see uh, how Siege in Atlanta went. And you already checked that out. Yeah, so that's all the news for this month. Uh, let's see if I hit all the... Okay, so the things that I've been working on. Since, since it's just me this month, I'm going to talk more about my stuff. So the one thing that I've been working on... Uh, I was wrapping up. I updated this North Avenue adventure game. So this is the first... This is the first game I've developed that's like a... Grand Theft Auto style game. So you're at Georgia Tech, and you play as Buzz, and you got all these different quests, but you can get in the Rambling Wreck, and you can do things like there's a quest called Up with, with the White and Gold, and you can get out and you put the flag. So there's three flags around campus uh, that you gotta raise. And then you got like Bobby Dodd Stadium over here, so you can like drive on North Avenue and drive into the stadium. Get rid of that. So you can play this on the web, or you can download it like a Ditchio, or I don't think I have it on Game Jolt yet. I need to put it up there. But yeah, you got these little GT logos that you can drive over and you can collect. Um, you can kick the football, so you, you you kick two field goals and you can can complete the quest. And after every quest you complete, you get credit hours. So Overall, I want the objective of the game to be like to uh, get what 120 credit hours. Uh, so as you collect these credit hours, you go from freshman to sophomore to junior and senior. So a little bar over there it fills up <clears throat> every time you earn credits. So it's still a work in progress. It's like I got the varsity over <clears throat> across from the interstate over there. Uh, I got Tech Tower. Uh, another quest is to collect the letters to return to Tech Tower. You can also see as you drive on the different roads, it changes the name of the roads. I just did that with a, a simple collider, so when it collides with a different road, then it changes the name of the road displayed up there. But yeah, there's a lot of work that can be, that still needs to be done with this. So it's like I got, got I got the base buildings created, but I only have like three or four buildings actually textured like tech tower and skiles and uh here's another quest right here is to take the books and deliver the books let's get uh advanced algorithms right there um, you can actually drive under skiles right here and collect more gt logos and after you collect so many gt logos then you can um you you actually get more credit hours for that but yeah, there's like the the Bunger Henry building over here, <clears throat> which I texture map. This is basically a cube, but through the magic of texture mapping, I'm using all real photos, and I just use the the perspective tool in GIMP uh, to line those to make a UV map to put on the different buildings. 
But it's like here's the College of Computing right here and de deliver the advanced algorithms book. So once you deliver all four books, then you complete that quest and you get more credit hours. But you also have like Run the Pi Mile, which is an annual 3.4 5K race around campus. Um, I have another quest to drive around campus. And um, yeah, that's about it for now. So yeah, once you deliver all the letters, then, then they all float over to Tech Tower. So yeah, that's North Avenue Adventure right there. One other thing that I've been working on recently, I noticed some people have been playing my pinball game, the Earth Ball game. So <clears throat> I've been working on updating the leaderboard. So previously, I just had one page on my website for all the leaderboards. Uh, so I went in and I did some Ajax, some uh, JavaScript um, to dynamically load uh, the scores right here on the game page. So like last night, so that's the one for Earthball. So last night I was working on 50 flags and I've been having a lot of issues with like the new version of Unity and the new version of Blender. It seems like I have to re-import a lot of the models to get everything working. Um, so I've been working on fixing all that. Uh, I noticed with the new Blender models that if you have a light source and a camera in your Blender model, when it imports, then it will also try to pull that new camera, new light source into Unity itself. With the old version of Unity and the older version of Blender, it would only import the mesh, which makes sense. Why, why would you want another camera and a light source? But yeah, here's like 50 flags right here all the times. And also you can click leaderboard here. So I got this working. I noticed my old leaderboards in Unity was using an old <clears throat> class called www. There's a new one called Unity. You have to like import uh, Unity networking. And it's like Unity web request. And I think a lot of the calls are the same. But... I think it's a better way. Apparently, the www is obsolete. You're supposed to be using the new Unity web request. And it seems like it, it's more likely to work with web games now. Now, if you have your game, web game hosted on a different domain uh, than your leaderboards, and I, th I think it still won't work. So, like, if I put a, a web game on Game Jolt and I have my web my leaderboards on LeviDSmith.com, then I think it still won't post that. But if you have your leaderboard API, your calls to your leaderboard, and your game hosted on the same domain, then I think you can post uh, those scores to, um, uh, to, you can post it from a web game. Now it seems to always work with a, uh, <clears throat> a desktop game, but I've noticed sometimes the, uh, antivirus like the Norton stuff it will try to block uh, the game from going out and um, <clears throat> and posting the scores and pulling back the scores so yeah that's all all for news this month let me close that right there so this month's topic is scratch I don't think anybody's joined yep I'm the only one okay so I'll go ahead and share this out just so if anybody does join. So share screen one. Okay. So this month's topic is scratch. I don't even have the slides up. I just created some simple slides. It's nothing fancy this time. <clears throat> so scratch. A uh, little bit of an overview. It's developed by MIT Labs. I don't know. Yeah, I guess it's just some students or maybe grad students I don't know created this so it's a a visual programming environment for beginners so it really isn't very extensive um, it's free to download and use create all the games you want um, and one reason that got me thinking about scratch is because the original version of scratch 1.4 was based on squeak and small talk which I talked about last month so if you're interested in Squeak and Small Talk, you can check that out. There's a website right there, scratch.mit.edu. 
scratch. It, there is a T. As, I guess it's a silent T in scratch. Scratch. <laughs> MIT.edu. So the nice thing is like they got a lot of example projects you can look at and stuff that people have created and share it out there. <clears throat> and like I was saying, it's got the design mode where you move blocks around. And this has also been used by other game development environments. I'm primarily Stencil, which I used years ago. So if you're looking for a little bit more, more flexibility, robustness, I would check out Stencil. You can do a lot more in Stencil. Maybe I'll do, do a talk about that soon. I, I just remember the problem with Stencil. I don't know if they're developing Stencil anymore. I remember I was like using version 2 or something, and then when they went to version 3, it broke a lot of stuff. So, it's like when they went to the latest version, it, oh, I guess it was 4.0. Yeah, when they went to 4.0, it seems like it broke a lot of my games. I never, I never got it working with the new version, so to get the old stuff working, I had to always uh, go back to the old, I guess, 3 version. But yeah, I'm kind of, yeah, there's another one called Hacks. I need to look into Hacks, H-A-X-C. Roadmap. Oh, so February 19, there was a build. February 2019, there was a build. And let's see here. So I guess they still are developing it. Seems like it, seems like it was a really long time. Yeah, so 3.4.0 was released in 2017. And then there was a long time off until January 2019. So yeah, it's worth checking out Stencil, which I said, said earlier. It's based on Scratch, which we're talking about today. So there's two ways you can develop with Scratch. There's a web version and an offline editor. Everything I'll be showing today is using the offline version. But with the web version, I think you can just go to profile. Um, oh, you just click create. You create an account. Then you click create. Oh, wow. Couldn't find the page. That's strange. Haven't seen that one before, but typically it comes, yeah, it comes up like this. Um, so you start out with this one guy, little cat. He's like your default object there, but I'll be talking about that in a minute. Um, the advantage to the offline editor and save projects to a file. Uh, oh, stencil. Uploaded the scratch. C R A T C H. You can upload it to the scratch website later if you got it how you want it. <clears throat> if you want to develop everything offline, then push it up to the scratch website later. You can do that with the offline version. And oh, by the way, I think all of the projects that you upload to the scratch website are publicly visible. Everybody can see your, like your code blocks. And I think people can remix your code. So if you're protective of your like IP or anything, I wouldn't paste it to scratch, at least not to the website. And then let's see here, file. Yeah, so you can't save your scratch to your computer. One downside to scratch is that it doesn't automatically save. So that's one bad thing if you got new developers and they're not accustomed to saving this isn't automatically going to save your work so make sure to save your stuff as I mentioned earlier there's a lot of different projects out here that you can play and download and I guess I like playing one the other night I'll leave this page there's like a uh, platformer and one was like a tower defense type thing but like popcorn the game. So it plays in this little window right here and just press the green flag and it's like this one's like a little I don't know, a little egg guy. It's got instructions over here and notes and credits on this side. <clears throat> Here's one about a pig, apple platformer. So the one nice thing is these are pretty fast to load. This one's like an apple and <laughs> like a mouse trap or something. Yeah. So this is a quick example. Oh, drummer, stick drummer. So. 
some of these are just like simple demos. They aren't really games or anything. But have your mouse over to customize sequencer. Little guy playing the drums and cymbals. <clears throat> okay, so I mentioned earlier you press the green flag to run the game. Then if you get in a game loop and you need to stop, you just press the red uh, octagon, the red stop sign. So here's Hello World and Scratch. So let's go ahead and do this. So you go and you create. So we've got a new Scratch game right here. So you can, they got all your different code blocks uh, categorized in these different sections like motion for moving your objects, looks, uh, it's like for changing your sprite and for displaying text. Sound is for playing different sounds. <clears throat> Events, when things happen, so I'll need to invent when the green flag, the green flag is kind of like your start. So when the green flag is clicked, I want to do something. So what I want to do is go back, go back to looks and say hello. Like, and you can change this string right here to be hello world. So when I click green flag, he's going to say hello world. So that's your simple hello world. You also have your control statements like your wait and your repeat loops or forever, your if then else statements and repeat until. Then your sensing, which is in blue, this light blue, this is for like when two objects or two sprites collide with each other. Um, or detecting mouse events or key press events. Your operators are like your uh, addition, subtraction, multiply, and divide for your integer variables. Uh, you can also pick random values. You can set a low end and a high end for your randoms. You can also do comparisons, greater than, less than, or equal. It doesn't have greater than or equal to, so you just got to kind of either do both of them or change the way you're doing your comparison. Then you got like your uh, Boolean operations, your ands, your ors, and your nots for your Boolean variables, your true and false. I'm not exactly sure what join and let, let. I think you can get like, uh, I think your join may be like concatenating two strings together. Letters like getting a specific letter of a string or length of gets the length of a string. You got your mod, which I talked about in the math get for game developers talk. Uh, basically returns the remainder when dividing two integers. And you got round for rounding values. And also you have this one like catch all. So you can do sine, cosine, logarithms. <laughs> so they kind of put everything else square root in this last one right here and you just pick what you want. Then you have variables. You have two types of variables. You have variables assigned to a, a specific object or sprite and then you have global variables. So when you create a variable, like I'll name it foo, then you can say for all sprites, so it's global or for this sprite only. I'll talk about it in a little bit, but my only, my biggest complaint about Scratch is there's no way to reference a property on a specific object or specific sprite. So to get a value off of the sprite, you have to save it to a global variable first and then pull it that way. I have, I've looked it up. I haven't found anybody else that has a good solution for that. But it'd be nice to be able to reference properties on a specific sprite or object. And then blocks, you can do like repeatable code, uh, reusable code, kind of like functions or procedures. You use blocks for that. <clears throat> so input, I talked a little bit about use the sensing options, and then you, you can use that to read keyboard and mouse input. Uh, you use ask uh, if you want to read in a string, and that ask value is stored in the answer. I guess it's not a variable, but it's kind of like a variable. But it's always stored in answer, which is also available uh, from that same sensing area. Then you can use set to assign answer to a variable. So if you need to change it or compare, things like that. So let me bring up Scratch. I want to <clears throat> file, load from your computer. 
and do the number guess. So this is like my, <clears throat> the one program I always recommend people start out with is a number guess game. So there's something called the backdrop under stage. So I think of backdrop kind of like a room or a scene in Unity, but it really isn't. If you switch backdrops, it, it doesn't give you a fresh set of objects or anything. So you can kind of treat a backdrop like, like a global area, but just know that if you switch backdrops, you, it, it doesn't clear out anything else. So all your old stuff is still hanging around. Because I was wanting to use like two backdrops, one for a title screen and one for the game. But if you switch over to game, all the stuff on your title screen is still there in the first backdrop. So I'm going to click this backdrop and you're going to see this code block that I have defined here. So when you pl click the green flag, which I said is kind of like your start method, then I created a variable called secret number. So and then I'm going to assign that to a random value, 1 to 100. I'm going to set these other two variables. So I'm going to use two variables, number guess and guess count. Set those both to 0. Uh, by default, they're 0, but just in case you want to play this again or something, it's go ahead and, better to go ahead and just <clears throat> clear those out to 0. And then there's something called hide variable. You can actually hide these, I think, through the interface. But you want to hide the secret number, because but by default... Whenever you create a variable in Scratch, it's going to display it up here in the upper left-hand corner. So we don't want people seeing what the secret number is. So we're going to start this loop, and until the number that the person has guessed equals the secret number, the random number from 1 to 100, then we're going to ask the player <coughs> to guess a number between 1 and 100. Then we're going to wait. Then once the person enters the number, then we're going to set that answer to the number guess. Then we're going to increment the guess count by one. So to increment, you just use the change block. And then you say change that variable guess count by one. So that, that's kind of like guess count plus plus in another programming language. So then after they enter that, if the number they guessed equals the secret number, then we're going to send this message. And you do that with broadcast. So we're going to broadcast print correct so that's one way to like have objects interact with each other is by using this broadcast method if the number that the person guessed is greater than the secret number then we're going to broadcast print lower and then if the number that the person guessed is less than the secret number then we're going to broadcast print higher <clears throat> And the reason we're using the broadcast method and not just printing it here is because on a backdrop, there is no like print method or anything. So to, get, to print something, then we're, we'll have to uh, get this little uh, cat guy. He receives the message print correct or print higher or print lower. So basically, he's just going to say correct, higher, or lower. So when we press the green arrow, I'm going to guess 50. So this is kind of like a uh, divide and conquer method that I use. So I guess 50, and he says lower, so I'm going to guess 25. Still lower, so let's guess 12. <coughs> so it's between 12 and 25, so let's guess 20. So it's between 20 and 25, let's guess 23. So it's between 20 and 23, let's guess 22. Lower, 21. Correct. So I guessed the correct number in seven tries, and the correct answer was 21. So and then you can just press the green arrow and play it again. And by the way, you can play this on my, um, from my scratch page. I think I'm just got tech grad. I'm going to got tech grad my stuff. And then the number guesses right here. So you just click on it. So this is playing the same thing through the web interface. And guess 50, lower, 25. And it should be a different different number, <laughs> secret number every time. 32, so it's between 32 and 50. Let's guess 40. 32 and 40, let's guess 36. So five guesses, and the secret number was 36. <clears throat>
So I talked about a little bit about the object-oriented features, um, the your code options depend on whether you have a backdrop or an object selected. So if you're looking for a print or a say, you don't see it, it's probably because you're on you got the backdrop selected and not an actual sprite object. <clears throat> so I've been kind of using sprite <coughs> and object interchangeably. I think in Scratch they call it a sprite, but I really think of it as an object. Um, you can move, rotate, all your standard things that you can do to a object in like Game Maker Unity. You can do it to a, a sprite object. You can change the sprites. They're actually called costumes. So a sprite is really a costume. You can kind of change that if you want to give like the appearance of an animation and things like that. So you can create a new object using the create clone block. So you can see this example when I start as a clone. You can set a random position, X and Y position. So you can instantiate multiple objects. So I'm glad they do have that in here. Um, and I already talked about broadcasting between different objects. Yeah, so that's the number guessing game right there, which I already showed. <clears throat> graphics, there is a simple graphics editor in Scratch. Um, I think you're stuck with a 480 by 360 resolution, so you don't have a lot of space. Um, and the coordinate system ranges from negative 240, negative 180, to 240 in the X and 180. So, zero, zero is actually the center of the of the great game screen where most like game development environments zero zero is either like in the upper left hand corner or in the lower right hand corner so be aware of that change um, you can upload your own sprites so in the next game I'll be showing I actually made my own sprites in GIMP and saved them you got many different options for saving these uh, many different formats, PNG, SVG, JPEG, and GIF. So you can upload those into Scratch. <clears throat> and if you're instantiating or if you have objects created, uh, by default those, those sprites are visible, so you can use the hide command to hide those objects until you need them. Um, in this case, I said, well, you could be like, uh, your ship could be dead or destroyed, but still playing a sound. So you don't want to delete it yet, but you still want it to exist in the game world. So you can use hide. And then you can also use show to make uh, hidden objects visible. So by default, when you create a sprite and you have it on your screen, <clears throat> you want to have it hidden because you don't want to have, like have everything in the game world visible to begin with. So what you want to do is you want to take that object and you want to clone it and then once you clone it it will be hidden so the first thing you want to do after you clone it is to show that object uh, collisions are pretty easy in scratch uh, you use the touching block and it'll have this little drop down that'll pop up so you can just uh, say whatever type of object you want to detect a collision with then after that you can run code so like for a ship when it when it, or an enemy, when it collides with the bullet, then you want to hide it, then play the enemy dead sound, then delete that clone. Or if an enemy touches the ship, the player ship, then just broadcast game over and like, go back to the main screen. <clears throat> the collision boxes are automatically generated. You have no ability to change the collision box. I think it apparently detects by the sprite size or, size or maybe... Uh, the transparency area. I'm not exactly sure if it's an actual box or uh, if it does it pixel perfect. I'm thinking it's just a box. As I mentioned earlier, you can create different methods uh, using the block the blocks area. So like in this, I have an enemy and I have two blocks. One's called moving left and one's called moving right. So he's going to move left until he gets to the left edge of the screen. Then we're going to call move right to start moving right. This probably isn't the best uh, method for doing this because I don't think it's ever going to escape the stack. So every time it needs to change direction, 
it's going to add like another <laughs> layer to the stack so you could get like a stack overflow type thing going on here but it's just a simple example of how to use different blocks or what we call procedures or functions methods in other programming languages i don't think you can one problem with scratch is you can't pass uh, parameters to a block or i think there's some other cases like if i instantiate an enemy i can't pass parameters to the enemy or a new object which is kind of unfortunate i wish they would add the ability to be able to pass parameters to a block <clears throat> sounds are pretty simple you can upload wave files or mp3s uh, for sound effects and music uh, it's pretty simple you just use the play sound method so like here we have a bullet <clears throat> or whenever you shoot and create a bullet then you just play the sound shoot which is a sound file you have uploaded so I guess we can show that let me go ahead and edit file load and I've got my simple shooter right here and replace the contents right here so yeah so in this one I got like three different objects a ship an enemy and a bullet and by default these are all hidden so when you press play it's going to show the title screen then I'm press a button and then it's going to start spawning these clones of enemies and then when you press the space bar then it's going to shoot so you hear that sound um, if we stop this and we look at bullet, you can see that play sound shoot until then. And one nice thing is like you, you have sounds associated to an object, so you can have multiple sound clips associated to uh, <coughs> what they call sprite, sprite object. And you can just play it right here, or you can modify it. You can make it move faster or slower. Make it louder, softer, and fade in, and fade out, and I don't know if there's like a revert in here or not. Robot kind of distorts it a little bit. Uh, yeah, there's like a back. So you can do robot. Gives it more robotic sound. Then you revert it as well. So there's a lot of cool tools that you can do. As I mentioned earlier, there's also a uh, the sprite editor, so we can uh, you can also take a picture from your camera and load it in directly. Um, choose a costume and use paint, so you can paint a new costume. So you got your standard like pencil tool or brush tool, an eraser, to erase paint bucket fill and you can choose your color it's like you got your hsv hue, hue saturation value right there and add text right there and you can do circles <clears throat> as well as lines and rectangles <clears throat> so i'm just going to delete that <coughs> Yeah, so sounds are pretty easy to load into, load into Scratch, and play. Um, if you load a sound to the background, it won't. Yeah, so if you if you try to load your sound into the background, if you have a sprite that needs to play sound, it won't be able to access it. So you have to load your sound directly to the sprite. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, some of the limitations you can't send a parameter with a broadcast message. You have to have the Scratch VM to run your games. Um, so if somebody has to download Scratch or play it from the website. It'd be nice if you could make your own like web build and host it from your own website. Or just like make an EXE or something to give to people. I mentioned about the global variables. If you need to pass a value between two objects, you gotta do it through a global variable. Um, and there's no the, the one of the biggest problems, there's no text output aside from the little say and think speech bubbles. It would be nice if there was a standard way to display text to the screen. I've seen some games where people actually create like a, a sprite as a number, but I think you got to do it for each digit in your number, and then you can like have a costume or a sprite for each digit, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. Then you just change the costume based on which digit it is. But 
That seems really convoluted just to display your own sprites to a screen. As I mentioned earlier, whenever you create a variable, it is displayed to the screen in the upper left corner by default, but you have no, you have little control over what it looks like. So you can actually like right click it and do a normal readout, a large readout, which just displays the number without the variable name, or a slider variable where you can like, change it yourself. But that, those are the only three options for uh, the, the change in the way your variable is displayed in Scratch. And finally, publishing game. I already talked about that a little bit. Just upload it to the website or create it directly on the website itself. So I'll go over a little bit more about the game that I created. So file, load from your computer. This is the, the final version right here, which I added a second enemy called Enemy 2. <clears throat> and the second enemy has a little bit more uh, functionality. Instead of just moving left and right, he's going to move in a sine wave. So let's press the green flag. So every fourth enemy is going to be this second type of enemy. He's just going to kind of like, like go in a sine wave from left to right until he reaches the bottom. <clears throat> then after he reaches the bottom, he's just going to disappear. I, I do had to, I did have to add some specific code to get an enemy to disappear. So basically when it gets to 180 or negative 181 in the y direction, then you basically just call the delete method. So that's what happens. I don't have any nice particle effects or anything whenever you collide with an enemy. You just have to stop and restart again. Um, so yeah, let's look at, look at the ship real quick. So I got these code blocks. You start the game. I'm gonna keep an alive variable. Just uh, it's kind of useful <clears throat> knowing if you're still alive or not. Because whenever you die, I just want to set the live flag as false and then quit quit looping after alive is false. I have a shoot delay, so. Uh, otherwise, if you don't have a shoot delay, then it's kind of going to look like a flamethrower. Whenever you shoot, it's going to try to shoot every frame. I think this runs at 30 frames a second. Maybe a way to change that. I'm not sure. But yeah, so here's like the key checks. If the left arrow is pressed or A is pressed, then we're going to move X by negative 4. If right arrow or D is pressed, then we're going to move by 4 in that direction. Now... <clears throat> The best way to do this is to use like a velocity variable because right now it's just moving at a constant speed. So really if I wanted to add to this, I would have a velocity and just increase the velocity instead of uh, moving in at a constant rate. The same thing for the up and down arrows. We're going to change by 4 when we press up or W. And then we're going to change by negative 4 and then when we press the down or S. <clears throat> but I'm going to add this additional check. Uh, for the Y position, if it's greater than negative 100, then we're going to keep it from moving past negative 100. Or if it's less than negative 160, then we're going to keep it at 160. That way it doesn't go all the way to the bottom, and it doesn't let you go past like uh, the bottom area of the screen. And here's the shoot delay. So if the shoot delay is uh, greater than zero, then we're going to decrease that by one. I don't know why this is in here twice. I think that's a mistake right there. So then when it, you can have this other event. It's under events. You can uh, do an event based on whether a key is pressed. So if the space is pressed, we're going to call this do shoot block. So in do shoot, we're going to check. Oh, so here's another advantage to we're having this is alive variable. So we don't want the player shooting if the ship has been destroyed. So we're going to say if the player is alive, if is alive is one, and I don't think there's a true and false boolean value, I think you just have to use integers. So if it alive is one and shoot delay is less than one, if, so that's kind of like a less than or equal to zero. So if it's less than, if it's less than one, then we're going to set the pos X and Y position, these variables for fire X and fire Y to the ship's X and Y. That way, whenever I instantiate the bullet over here, then I can set the X and Y values of the bullet to the fire X and fire Y 
<clears throat> uh, global variables. So that's where it'd be nice if I had a ship where I could just create a clone of bullet and then directly on the bullet set the X and Y. But you can't do that. You have to assign those to these temporary global variables. Then after we shoot, we want to set a shoot delay to 30 so you can't shoot again for like another second. The enemy, I talked about this a little bit earlier, but we're going to start a clone. And by the way, you can click on any of these and you can click the little eyeball here and it will show you <clears throat> that sprite over here. So, but by default, anything that we clone, like a bullet or an enemy, we're going to have those hidden by default. So an enemy, so I think I already talked about all this uh, on the other slide. We're basically just going to move left and right. This isn't the best method, but it does demonstrate the ability to call different uh, code blocks right here. And then for the second enemy, then I just have one method for this one. So forever, we're just going to call move. And I'll actually show you up here if you have them uh, enabled right there. <clears throat> then we're going to just have this one move method that gets called every frame. <clears throat> and then we're going to set the, we're going to decrease the Y value. And then the X value is going to be determined by the sign value of the Y position. Then we're going to multiply that by 100 just so it isn't. So we actually get some further movement in the, <clears throat> in the X direction. And then we're going to add this X offset which is a random variable that I pick between negative 100 and 100. That way, whenever the enemy spawns, he isn't spawning at the exact same position every single time. So then if the enemy's Y position is less than 180, then we're going to delete that clone. If you don't do this, then the enemy will just be stuck at the bottom of the screen and will never uh, disappear. Yeah, so that's basically Scratch. Uh, as I mentioned, I have like two different screens, so like the backdrop. Whenever this thing starts up, I'm gonna. Whenever you press the green flag, we're gonna change the black drop to title. And then you're gonna wait till space is pressed, or you get a mouse down uh, event, and then we're gonna change the backdrop to the Starfield backdrop, and then call start game. So this way, the game doesn't actually do anything until you press space or you click the button right there. So then, once you either press space or press the mouse button, then uh, we're going to broadcast start game. So that's when it sets the score to zero and then it starts the game loop right here. And oh, by the way, here's where it, it waits two seconds and it spawns a new enemy every two seconds. And I keep this spawn count variable. So if the spawn count, I increase the spawn count by one <clears throat> for in, every time an enemy is spawned. So if the spawn count mod four equals three, so if it for every fourth enemy then then we're going to create a clone of the second type of enemy the one that moves in a sine wave otherwise just create the basic enemy that moves left and right Re the reason why i put this at three because whenever the spawn count at zero so uh zero mod four is going to be zero so if i put it to zero then you're going to have that second sine wave enemy as the first enemy but i just wanted a regular enemy as the first enemy. So um, then when it goes to one, spawn count goes to one, mod four is one. Then when it goes to two, then mod four is two. And then three, mod four is three. So that's when it spawns the, the second type. Then when we, it rolls over to four, so four mod four is zero. So then we're going to start back until we reach another mod three, then uh, spawn the, the sine wave moving enemy. So anyway, uh, that's basically Scratch. Uh, I'll post all the code and links and everything to the website. So be sure to check out noxgamedesign.com for all the latest information. Sign up for the mailing list. <clears throat> Not sure what we'll do next month. I may do SDL or Allegro or Java, something like that. Um, so yeah, my website is levidsmith.com. Find me on social media at GA Tech Grad. And we'll see what else is up here. You can find links to all the old meeting videos over here on the noxgamedesign.org website. Sign up for the meeting list here. You can listen to the podcast directly to the player on the right side right there. Or you can click podcast in the menu bar. 
and that will take you to iTunes and you can subscribe or listen whatever you want to do on iTunes um, we also have a discord channel so if you want to talk to us and uh, see what we're doing we usually we're usually in there during Ludum Dari and game jabs and things like that got the forums right here so if you want to discuss anything about game development or game design just create an account right there and all as always and this is how I knew about the Click Team Fusion thing earlier. We've got a directory page, so if you want to know if anybody uh, has an experience in any specific development environments, you can check here uh, to see all the people who have come to our meetings in the past <clears throat> and who have a social media presence. So you can find links to all of the Knoxville developers, all their websites, and their social media accounts on here, and also links to their games. So that's going to wrap it up for November 2019, and we'll be back next month with a new topic. Thanks everyone for watching.